Islamabad looks as vibrant as ever, but even the capital is on high alert. This entire country is under attack from the inside. I'm on my way to a military hospital to see some of the victims. These soldiers were sent to the heart of a conflict that's been largely hidden from the world. They've come back profoundly damaged and disabled. Good. Achieve and lockers. Good. Chal. Saat chalo. Good. Well, most of the patients we are receiving at Armed Forces Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine are coming from the western borders of Pakistan, where the war and terror is in progress. The mind blast injuries are the most common causes uh, which they are having in those areas as they are deployed there. Major Dr. Muhammad Ali gets new amputees to treat every week. That's good. Good. As you have seen one of the patient here, he has got uh, three limb amputation. That is one uh, above elbow and uh, bilateral uh, transfemoral amputation that is above knee amputation. They are pretty tough men and uh, at every stage of life, I personally uh, learned so many things from them. That how motivated and how robust they are, that even with this challenge, uh, they are living a successful life. In the past nine years, more than 5,000 Pakistani soldiers have been killed and nearly 9,000 wounded fighting militants on the western border. Some of the enemy are Afghan and Arab fanatics who fled from Afghanistan, but most are their own people. Pakistanis inspired by the foreign militants to kill, maim and bomb their fellow countrymen. The victims aren't just soldiers. There are nearly daily attacks on civilians, like this July bombing of a police graduation ceremony live on TV. The main culprits are the Pakistani Taliban. They're an offshoot of the Afghan Taliban and even more ruthless. For 10 years, Pakistan's foremost expert on extremism, Ahmad Rashid, has warned of their rise. From being a very small group uh, controlling a small area, uh, they have expanded. They now have enlisted the support of militant groups as in Karachi, in, in Punjab, in Sindh, Kashmiri groups who were fighting in the Indians in Kashmir. There is now a full-scale extremist movement in Pakistan that is trying to overthrow the state. The inspiration and agents of some of the worst acts of terrorism inhabit these remote landscapes in a place called Waziristan. According to US intelligence, even the Bali bombings that killed 88 Australians can be traced back to this frontier. Pakistan's porous border with Afghanistan is wide open to smugglers and terrorists. Since 2002, it's been the real home of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. They simply relocated here after the US-led invasion. While the world has been focused on Iraq and Afghanistan, Pakistan has been fighting an even costlier war in its own territory. The border region we're heading to is normally off limits to most Pakistanis, let alone foreigners. But we've been given unprecedented access to go inside Pakistan's war on the enemy within. We head west through Khyber Pukhtunwa, the province British colonialists called the Northwest Frontier. It's the end of Pakistan proper. Beyond here is a kind of no-man's land called the Tribal Agencies. 
Since colonial times, Pashtun tribesmen here were allowed to run their own affairs. But since the US invasion of Afghanistan, they've been taken over by militants. In the tribal areas, half the population has fled, not so much because of the army, but because of the Taliban. They hate the Taliban, they're scared of the Taliban, and they fled. And they, they, some have fled as far as Karachi and, du, and Dubai and the Gulf. Others have fled to refugee camps just outside the tribal areas. It's taken months for us to get permission to travel to the tribal belt. The army has agreed to take us to a part it says it's liberated. But we have to travel in a heavily armed convoy with two mounted machine guns. The army will also call the shots on what we can film. Our destination is the tribal agency of South Waziristan. In 2009, under intense US pressure, Pakistan sent in the army to clear out the Taliban. Soldiers fought village by village and mountain by mountain. Many Taliban were killed, but many more simply retreated just beyond the army's reach into a forbidding wilderness. This operation is basically a location which is overlooking some of the approaches which can be used by the terrorists. Colonel Hussain is one of the frontline commanders trying to hold on to this hard-won territory. But the terrain gives a clear advantage to insurgents. And uh, be careful. You falling here is at the cost of something. So be very, very careful. Okay. So this must have been incredibly difficult terrain to fight in. You tried to take these hills. It's very difficult. The life is very difficult at the post. Yeah. You know, the people fetch water from the, down the downstream. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's, it's really <laughs> very tough. But, uh, you know, this is part of a soldier's life. The yeah. rugged landscape isn't the only challenge. The enemy retains a home ground advantage. They grew up here. And they would have known this area very well, the Taliban, the locals. They yes, would have... obviously. The, yeah. the Taliban, they're locals from this area. Yeah. So anyone who has been, you know, grazing his uh, animals here for 30 years, yeah. he knows he's in every stone of this area. On windswept mountaintops like this, they scan the area for Taliban and drill for attacks. So this, this, I just wanted to show you the wilderness of this area. Yeah. You know, the mountains, the valleys, and uh, the nalas. Mm. You know, virtually, it's not possible to hold each and every peak. Mm. So you have to have uh, domination at the top from where you can see different places, valleys emerging, mm. and then can observe the moment. Big job. And it's a difficult one. <laughs> These are some of the men they're fighting. A local journalist filmed this rare footage in winter of the Pakistani Taliban moving secretly through South Waziristan. They're allies of the Afghan Taliban, but they have their own leaders and agenda. Unlike the Afghans, they're not trying to rid the country of foreigners. They want to replace their own government with a Sharia dictatorship. جمهوریت خبر مو وکړه چې جمهوریت کفر دی جمهوریت جوړ شوی د یهود د لوسدای او د مسلمان د تفریقی او تقسیم ورې د پر حکیم مولانا مسعود is one of their most powerful leaders خپل وطن دومره چې د پاکستان حکومت چې دی غلام حکومت دی د امریکایونه او د اوباما عبادت کوینی کی خلق تی دغه د اوباما د امریکایون خبره په دې داس لګیږي لکه چې میشته د خدای امر شکری South Waziristan is now under complete military control. It feels like a wasteland. Most of the villages are still deserted. Civilians were ordered to leave so the army could launch its operation. 
The few men who've been given permission to return have had to surrender their traditional weapons. The only women we see are fully veiled. Please don't tell me the ladies we have told you a number of times. Please. You haven't told me that, but now I know. I have told you a number of times. Where? Where? Everywhere, everywhere. Army minders order us not to film. In this culture, women can't show their faces to strangers. Waziristan, now divided into a North and South agency, has a long history of militancy. The British colonialists had little control here beyond the forts they built along the road to Afghanistan. They had to bribe tribal elders called Maliks to allow their soldiers safe passage. What I find really striking about this place is that even the villages are built as fortresses. There are two main tribes here, the Masuds and the Wazirs, and historically, when they haven't been united fighting outsiders, they've been fighting each other. This is a land where war has traditionally been a part of life, where life is governed by an iron tribal code and where offences of honour have to be settled in blood. It's no wonder the British, who had the misfortune of trying to conquer Waziristan, called it Hell's Doorknocker. Like the British, Pakistan has decided it can't defeat the militants by force alone. It's begun a second campaign for hearts and minds. The army is rebuilding much of what it destroyed in the fighting. It's constructed a new technical college alongside new homes and cottage enterprises. The aim is to create jobs so these young people aren't tempted to join the Taliban. But when we visit one of the army-built markets, the mood is more resentful than grateful. And your name is Mohammed? Mohammed Arshan. OK, and I am Eric. Some reckon the army's operation against the Taliban did more harm than good. Were you scared of the Taliban when they were here? No, I was scared of the Taliban when they were here. I was scared of the Taliban when they were in Pakistan. I was scared of the Taliban when they were here. I was scared of the Taliban when they were here. I was scared of the Taliban when they were here. I was scared of the Taliban. So when you came back and saw everything was destroyed, how did you feel? Tabuyi khuda tabuyiwa, chhu demi dia ulah tab sahi malumat nista day. Sida khabarat. Chhme le khawan de rangi dia. Kana acha kurn de. Tabas shayi di. Acha arts khatam shayi di. Schooli na close di. Talim nista. Baraya ras khali das teacher roshi misala ziri uga ko dialuri. Da chhu sumra schooli ki di. Hada dega tine tine char char saal already zaya shayi di. Char char total nine saal. Am saal da zaya shayi di. Da khu bilkul sahi ya khu archa ta pata do. Perhaps the Taliban went out of their way to keep these locals on side. Or maybe people are still scared of Taliban retaliation. Surrounded by soldiers, it's hard to gauge what anyone really thinks. Inside this store, the merchant, Abdul Ghafoor, assures us all is fine. So are there any problems now? So what was it like when the Taliban were here? Really? Why were they good days? Days. Why were they good days when the Taliban were here? <laughs> Have there been any bad times here? No, they are not. No, they are not. Life is good. <laughs> How is business? So business is good. It's good, is it? Uh, I thought it would be. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we leave just as onlookers start joking about kidnapping us, something the Taliban did often for money. <laughs> 
Se va a dar a bajar está bien, ¿ah? ¿Dónde Sí, la voy a apoyar a partir de ahí, la voy a dejar bajar. No, pero es que no es que no es que no It's not surprising that the locals are unwilling to criticize the Taliban. There are sympathizers with a keen sense of hearing, and there are fears the militants could return at any time. When they were here, the Taliban didn't hesitate to kill anyone who stood in their way, from tribal elders to local soldiers and police. It's relatively peaceful now, but this place has seen some horrors. There used to be a fort beside this cricket field, and when the Taliban stormed it in 2008, they captured 38 soldiers and cut their heads off. Then they set up their headquarters in the school on the other side of the stadium. When the army retook the fort a year later, 1,200 people died in a single week. The war destroyed most of the village. The army has now rebuilt it to try to lure people back but it's going to be a long, slow process. Only a handful of villages have been repopulated. Most people are still living in camps or with relatives around Pakistan. But there is one striking improvement here. For the first time, girls are going to high school. So what do you see that how different has it become now? The army has built a new school for girls up to the age of 18. It's a surprising sight in an area where females are all but invisible. She's promised to give some laptops. An independent aid consultant, Australian Jennifer Mackay, one of the few daring to come to this area, has been raising money to outfit it with textbooks and uniforms. The exciting thing about this school is that um, despite what people think about uh, girls' education in Pakistan, particularly, the tribal areas is that the community here wants girls to go to school so they donated the land for the school the army built the school and so a bunch of friends were helping fit it out i would be here forever i will always help you jennifer mckay first came to pakistan in 2005 to help with earthquake relief and decided to stay on she found hardly any outside aid was coming to waziristan partly because of negative perceptions that she says are wrong. I think what really keeps me here is the hospitality and generosity of the people. Even here in Waziristan, the communities are extraordinarily welcoming, which wasn't really what I expected. But it soon becomes apparent this is still a deeply conservative place. While the principal is happy to teach older girls, he doesn't want us to film them. That's very special. But it, it would be good to be able to at least show something of what is here. Because this is a very special school. And so it's a story that's worth telling. So would it be possible, we really need to have some pictures of just the young girls, the little children? Finally, after long appeals from Jennifer Mackay, he allows us to see the youngest children. Education is a critical part of peace building and stability. The country needs a lot of help with education anyway. A lot of schools are quite deprived. But here, in post-conflict areas, education is really critical to you know, countering extremism and just generally the future prosperity and peace. So it's a, it's a very useful investment, important investment. So that's one way of keeping the Taliban at bay? Yes, it is. It is. To educate girls is really important because they bring up healthier children. They make sure that both their boys and girls go to school. Um, so education, whether it's for boys or girls, plays an important role in keeping, yes, the Taliban at bay. Most of the Taliban retreated across the mountain into North Waziristan, where they roam freely.
This video footage filmed by a Pakistani journalist shows militants in control of the main city of Miran Shah, while the army has hunkered down in a nearby fort. The government has so far been afraid to launch another big operation. The big danger is that if um, this continues indefinitely, um, the Taliban will become more powerful than the army. The Taliban even have a media studio in North Waziristan. It makes internet videos like this one teaching children to be suicide bombers. Pakistan's now trying desperately to stop this insurgency. The irony is that it may have helped create it. For many years, Pakistan's military intelligence agency, the ISI, secretly supported militants in Afghanistan. The aim was to make sure Pakistan had a compliant neighbour, no matter which side won the war. There's been this double game that has gone on for many, many years about um, Pakistan supporting the NATO presence in Afghanistan um, uh, and, uh, and at the same time allowing the Afghan Taliban to operate against the NATO forces. So by trying to um, enhance Pakistan's security by supporting the Afghan Taliban, they've actually undermined their own security because of the effect it's had on the Pakistan Taliban. Exactly, exactly. I think that's the best way of putting it. I mean, the fact was that, you know, and, and people like myself were warning um, in my writings, you know, I've been warning the Pakistani government uh, back in 2003 that uh, because I visited some of these training camps and uh, I saw what the army and the ISI were doing in 2003. And I wrote about this. And, um, and of course, you know, th they didn't like it. But I said, the more you do this, encourage the Taliban to attack in Afghanistan, the backlash is going to come on Pakistan. Because these camps and this setup and this radicalization is all taking place in Pakistan with the help of Pakistani tribesmen who are then going to get radicalized. And of course, that's exactly what happened. You had the growth of the Pakistani Taliban. The US isn't waiting for Pakistan's permission to strike back. It's using drones to attack Taliban bases like this Waziristan training camp. It was completely destroyed in a recent strike, and this commander was killed. But each successful attack creates more enemies among the public. There is one bright spot. Back in Khyber Pukhtunwa, we were taken to meet some former Taliban operatives who the army captured. They're being held in a special de-radicalization center outside the frontier city of Tunk. We were allowed to film here on condition we don't show their faces in case the Taliban take revenge on them. Wasim, who's 22, was a civil engineering student when the Taliban recruited him two years ago. The <laughs> The inmates are learning new trades and getting religious re-education from anti-Taliban mullahs. Surrounded by soldiers, all tell us they now see the error of their ways.
It's hard to know who to believe, from the lowliest foot soldier to the height of government. The army, at least, seems determined to fight the Taliban's rise in any way it can. But the biggest challenge may be yet to come. By the end of the year, almost all the coalition's combat troops will leave Afghanistan. Militants on both sides of the border are waiting. They're preparing not to make peace, but rather to escalate the war, which they feel that they will be able to do in a better way once the Western forces have left. So they see it almost as a retreat? Oh, yes, without a doubt. This is very similar to the circumstances in which the Soviets left Afghanistan. Australia and the US are about to end their longest ever military engagement. But the war isn't over. It's just starting its next phase. Thank you.